Hi, everybody. Good to be with you. This is Michael Millerman. And today I wanted to talk to you about one of the questions that first interested me most within philosophy. So as I was an undergraduate student at the University of British Columbia, I formulated eventually towards the end of my program the question, what is the relationship between how we think about politics on one hand and how we think about metaphysics, ontology, first philosophy, maybe even theology on the other hand? In other words, how do our political ideas relate to our ideas about the nature of reality, the nature of human existence, the nature of the cosmos? So that's proven to be such a nice question because it branches out into both the history of philosophy, metaphysics and ontology, into the deepest depths of theology and existential thought and mysticism and everything else that you could ever want to uh, contemplate. On the other hand, though, it's kept it grounded by seeing how our political ideas vary as a function. And so it's been a nice lens and a nice window into both politics and philosophy. So I just thought it would be nice for us to talk about that a little bit together here today. And also, you know, I posted on, uh, on my Twitter not very long ago that, uh, where is that here? Uh, one second... One second, one second, one second. Yep. I posted a moment ago or a day or so ago. Uh, nope. Okay, hold on. Sorry. Navigating my broadcast tools here. Not super effectively. But yeah, on my Twitter, I posted the question that interested me since undergraduate. What's the relationship between metaphysics and politics? How do our political ideas vary as a function of our thoughts about the nature of reality? How's our basic metaphysical outlook made to conform to political priors? So a lot of people made nice comments here about how in Heidegger, for example, uh, you have not just that he was a brilliant philosopher, but apparently also made poor judgment in politics, uh, his lack of moderation, support um, as it was of the Nazi party, is a huge debate. For, take, this, take this issue. If we just start with this issue, you could even just start and stop with this issue. The greatest philosopher of the 20th century, Martin Heidegger, had this, let's say, difficult, checkered, unpleasant, and apparently not very uh, good grasp of the nature of political life. He made poor decisions. He didn't somehow see what was at stake politically, or he conflated the politics and the philosophy to such an extent. So people always wonder, how could you have this combination? What was it about the way that Heidegger philosophized that made him believe what he believed about German destiny, German history, the role of the Jews in the uprooting of mankind and the processes of alienation and machination and so on. Uh, is there something that, here, let me formulate it for you this way. This is kind of like how Leo Strauss responded to Heidegger in a sense. If you believe that you are part of a historical destiny, in other words, if you defer your judgment to historical forces. History will judge. History will say. History is the final arbiter. History will decide. And you've heard other more banal versions of this, like you're on the right side of history or you know, you're know you um, a reactionary, which means you're, in some sense, you're going against the direction of historical progress. All of that implies, beneath the surface of the political formulations, a view about the meaning of history a view about the meaning of time, or you could say a view about the relationship between being and time. So Heidegger had one understanding of the relationship between being and time that allowed him to defer, as it were, to the destiny of being, the history of being. And when you have recourse to history as your standard, you have recourse to something that changes, something that develops, something that comes and goes, Maybe something that doesn't serve as a solid, stable, transhistorical standard of judgment. So the anti-historicists, people who do not think that being develops in time, people who think that being transcends time, or that the eternal order is outside of the historical process, they think, with their notions, whether of natural law or of natural right or of what have you, that human judgment can have recourse to a stable, steady, knowable standard of judgment. Historicism denies that. There's a nice quote I should share with you about that too, but 
it's not just Heidegger. Here's uh, Leo Strauss's lecture transcript uh, on Hegel. And Hegel too, as you may or may not know, because of his philosophy, because of his metaphysics, because of his understanding about the nature of reason, self-consciousness, providence, wisdom, and all of that, he too defended a progressive view of history. And there's a link between his understanding of the best political order, a certain kind of constitutional state, and his understanding of the nature of reason itself, as it were, absolute reason, absolute spirit, God's spirit in time. Gradually unfolding, developing, progressing, realizing itself, and becoming concrete. So I think it's an amazing and surprising thought for people who aren't familiar with it initially, that there should be any kind of relationship between politics, which seems like pretty, you know, hard-headed, down-to-earth, jostling for power, money, influence, position, prestige, and so on, and basic kinds of problems like our tax funds being allocated wisely, do you have to wait longer than you'd like to in the hospital, and so on, that the whole realm of politics should have something to do with abstract reasoning about the nature of reality as such. And yet, there is that link. Example, as I said, Hegel. Example, Heidegger. Uh, Heidegger, a, a nice conspicuous example in this book, Parmenides, where Heidegger is discussing, among other things, the question of truth that's to be found in Parmenides' poem, one of Parmenides' poems. You think, wow, that sounds pretty abstract. That sounds kind of like pure philosophy concerned with the nature of truth and how the different ways the Greek word for truth was translated into Latin changed the way that it was understood. But in the course of these reflections, Heidegger raises to our attention the difference between the Greek polis and the Roman, the notion of the political. So he says, even moving from the language of the polis to the language of the political, moving from the Greek world to the Roman world, wasn't just a change in the words we spoke or the language we used, it was a fundamental reconfiguration of the basic metaphysical structure of things, which is amazing. And he makes a case for it. So here's another example. Medieval Jewish thinker Moses Maimonides raises the following question. Not the only person to have done so, but he does it in a specific sort of way. If you are a medieval Jew, let's say, or a medieval Muslim, and you're living under the authority of the Torah or the Jewish law on one hand or the Sharia, the Islamic law on the other hand, and you uh, believe that the law under which you live was a divine revelation. And one of the principles of the possibility of a divine revelation of the law, as you can see from the very beginning of the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, for example, is that the Almighty, God, created the universe. So there's a kind of link or a relationship between the, as it were, metaphysical idea that the universe is created and the political idea that a law is revealed. And Maimonides, like some of the medieval philosopher theologians, knew very well that, for example, in Aristotle's thought, the world is not created, but rather it is eternal. And Aristotle had good reasons for defending the thesis that the world was not created, not made, but rather that it has always been. So on one hand, you belong to a religious community structured by a divinely revealed law that depends, in a way, on the idea that there's a creator God, on the other hand, you're familiar with a set of arguments from Greek philosophy that the world was not created, but rather eternal. And the argument that the world is eternal has the political effect of undermining the foundations of the revealed law. You see? It's just another example. Just another example. The life of Socrates, in its own way, is an example of the relationship and the possible conflict between philosophy and politics or between metaphysics and politics because you know in the life of Socrates you see that he asked questions that had the effect of 
undermining to a certain extent the prevailing beliefs of the political community, the ones that structured the political life, for, exa for example, about the Olympian gods, the nature of the gods, whether they exist, if they exist, do they have any concern for human affairs? And if they do have a concern for human affairs, can we influence them through ritual, through sacrifice and so on? So politics on one hand, metaphysics on the other. One of the things that could be interesting uh, for you to know, let me see whether I can pull this up. I'll give credit where it's uh, due. So here's a book I read in my master's year at the University of Toronto called Post-Foundational Political Thought, Political Difference in, and then these are four French uh, thinkers, Nancy, Lafort, Badieu, and Leclau. The author of this book is Oliver uh, Marchart, uh, Marchart. Post-Foundational Political Thought. And what I want to say about this book, what I learned from the book, um, which was thought-provoking at the time, they said, there are these French thinkers. This is how I learned about left Heideggerianism. And then eventually I brought Dugan to the table as an alternative. And I wrote my first paper on this topic called Heidegger Left and Right, a theme that I then developed into my two books, one on Heidegger, one on Dugan. So what I learned from uh, post-foundational political thought was this idea that French thinkers had taken a distinction in Heidegger's philosophy and mapped it over onto the language of politics and the political. So I just want to tell you that very quickly. There's this division in Heidegger between the ontic and the ontological. The ontic concerns beings and the ontological concerns being. So you could say it's ontologically, I'll give you just a very rough example here. It's ontologically the case that I, the human being, can always choose or I always am in the world in a certain way. That's an existential ontological fact about the structure of my existence. But it's an ontic detail how I fill in the blanks, whether I you know, go, go to the kitchen or go for a walk, you know, the details. That's one thing, like the specific versus the general, again, rough and ready, or another one, if I'm talking about things in the world, like my pen, cup, uh, camera, TV, and so on, monitor, you know, that's ontic because it concerns beings, it doesn't concern beings. So there's this division, ontic, ontological, beings, being. And the French thinkers, as I learned from this book, it's the first time that I really heard it put this way, they generated a parallelism Ontic is to politics as ontological is to political. And this served as a kind of link between the language of ontology with all of the distinctions that Heidegger develops over the course of his works and the language of how we think about what we normally call politics. So is politics the same? Is talking about politics the same as talking about the political? Or is somehow the political the arena in politics is what happens within the arena. You start to make these little distinctions and divisions. And then the step that, in my case anyways, brought me from the French Heideggerians to Dugin's Russian Heideggerianism. I'll just mention this in passing. I've written about it before. The French focused on these two things, the ontic and the ontological. But Heidegger, he has a third uh, division, third category, a third realm. So this one he calls the ontological difference, the difference between beings and being. But in later works, he starts to say the whole question of the meaning of being, the whole question of truth and history and existence and all of that, it actually can't be resolved, as it were, within the ontological difference. It can't be resolved on the basis of the split between the ontic and the ontological. Rather, the whole problem in some sense for Heidegger is that the history of philosophy has thought about being on the basis of beings as that which is most common to them and as that which makes them what they are. So you look around you, there's a bunch of beings. You could say stuff about it. This one's round, this one's square, this one's hot, this one's cold. But what do they have in common? What do they most have in common? That they are, that they are in being, okay? That they exist as it were. So being gets read off of beings. It's derived on the basis of beings. It's thought in relation to beings. That's what Heidegger means by metaphysics. That's something that he says about the ontological difference. And that for him is misleading, ultimately. Because Heidegger poses the question, 
which in my view, the French Heideggerians here left out of their picture. The question, can we leap, as he puts it, directly into the question of being without seeing it as that which is most common to beings? In other words, you see what I mean? We're not going to start from beings. We're going to go directly into the question of being, configuring it in a different way. And he marked that in German by spelling the word being differently. So not S-E-I-N, but S-E-Y-N. In English translations, instead of B-E-I-N-G, you sometimes, they sometimes, the translators use B-E-Y-N-G. So now take a step back. Ontic is like politics. Ontological is like the political. And then you have this third thing, B-E-Y-N-G, and on the other column you have a question mark. That question mark is where Dugan's Heideggerianism slots in. The French don't go there because they pay much less attention to Heidegger's idea of another beginning of philosophy, one that you'd inaugurate by leaping directly into the question of being, and they spend more time focusing on the end of metaphysics, which for them the first two, col- the first two rows are enough. So French Heideggerianism, left Heideggerianism, deconstructive postmodernity, postmodernity, end of metaphysics. But as soon as you put another beginning of philosophy on the table, like Heidegger did, then you have something completely different. And Dugan, as far as I know anyway, among Heideggerian political philosophers, is the one who most prominently took up the idea of another beginning of philosophy and ran with it. But continuing to explore the parallelism between what that means for philosophy and what it means for politics. Hence, all of Dugan's work about the political significance of Dasein. So, okay, that was abstracter than I wanted it to be initially. I thought this was going to be a very simple introductory stream, but um, my two books here, beginning with Heidegger, talks about the reception of Heidegger's philosophy among political theorists, and my uh, Dugan book over here, Inside Putin's Brain, The Political Philosophy of Alexander Dugan, focuses really on the meaning of all of that in Dugan's political philosophy. But you see the general question. Uh, The general question, how does what we think about politics affects what we think about metaphysics and vice versa you know for some people they're radically distinct there's no connection for other people they are merged there's no distinction somehow it's the same thing and there's this middle ground you know so i'll give you an example something may be just imagine this is a very simple schematism something may be true philosophically and good for politics to know or to recognize. But it may also be true philosophically and dangerous or bad for politics. And therefore, politics might have to lie about it or the philosophers might have to lie to the political people about it. Something might be false philosophically and dangerous politically. Okay, so it's both wrong and dangerous. But something might be false philosophically and very useful for political life. You have the Notions in the history of philosophy of the noble lie, of a civil or civic religion, of things that are politically valuable, but philosophically murky, let's say, and vice versa. Things that are philosophically profound, but politically very dangerous. So, for example, criticism of civilization. Leo Strauss writes in one of his essays that uh, criticism of civilization is philosophically necessary, but politically very dangerous. Uh, you know, you're always in the situation here of opening a can of worms. So those of you who have, you sort of tend towards, you're more, you know, one professor said this about me before, and I'm sure many of you can relate uh, to this in your own lives. He said, you're too philosophical for political science departments, sort of, and too political for philosophy departments. So if you find yourself separately from the department side of things, like, too philosophical for pure politics, but also too political for pure philosophy, then there's this sweet spot. Political philosophy, political theory, political ontology, political theology, political metaphysics, metapolitics, all of which is combining, connecting, or exploring the interrelation between these two realms or domains, these two sets of uh, authors, Uh, Heidegger being an example, as I said, Hegel being an example, okay, there are others, you know, many others. Kant, because on one hand, you're reading Critique of Pure Reason and exploring the nature of the transcendental uh, a perception, apparently a very purely philosophical kind of question. 
But then on the other hand, you see that it develops out into a teaching that has great significance for politics, law, morality, ethics, and so on. Another thing, a book I've been teaching in private tutoring, uh, you haven't heard me discuss, discuss Agamben very much uh, anywhere, I would say, not in writing, not on this channel, but I have been reading Agamben quite diligently lately in my uh, tutoring sessions. And here too, he has an argument about the nature of sovereignty that is both philosophical and abstract. So for example, he says one of the issues in the paradox of sovereignty has to do with the fact that we still have the categories of actuality and potentiality. And then he goes into a discussion of Aristotle's um, presentation of the division between actuality and potentiality. So you're like, wow, that sounds like a completely non-political, totally abstract question. And yet for Agamben, it's intimately related to the crisis of law, legality, legitimacy, the constant state of exception, Okay, the relationship for Agamben between actuality and potentiality, which seems like purely philosophical, is directly related to the state of exception where a law is suspended and the sovereign has basically total power to imprison you, to kill you, to uh, do what he will with you because you've been, as it were, banished from the legal order without being banished from the political territory, a phenomenon that he calls and describes the camp. Okay, like the extermination camps, but he thinks now that everywhere is in the situation of a camp. Everybody is in the state of being under a law that they've been banished from or that has been suspended in this emergency state. So why do, again, why do I say all this? Because these kinds of, it's maybe, you know, it's the continental philosophy more so than the analytic, what that brings you right up into those sweet spots where you can be talking about something seemingly very abstract, but always cognizant of its political double or dimension or the uh, its parallelism the mirror you know it's the two sides of a coin uh, that you can flip as you will so uh just a couple of that's basically what i wanted to say to you that's the question that's always interested me so if you've been following my work for any time and attracted and interested uh in my work that's the that's how this question was configured for me early on that's why I love Strauss so much, too. When he writes about the history of political philosophy, he's in that sweet spot and he's bringing out details that we don't usually see ourselves. Uh, but also the interest in Dugan, the interest in Heidegger and Derrida as well. I don't think Derrida gets enough positive credit. Uh, I've mentioned him from time to time. I learned to appreciate him as a, as a writer and a thinker. So everybody has that in common among the authors that I study. So that's why I wanted to share it with you. Okay, I saw some things in the chat. Let me go, let me see here. Uh, Dugan's concept of archaeomodernity. Yeah, in my Dugan book, I do have a lot on that, on archaeomodernity and on how he, how he understands it, how he sketches it out, how he uses uh, Heidegger to understand archaeomodernity and to overcome archaeomodernity. So maybe I'll do a separate video on it because it would take, it's kind of a long argument and I have a nice pictures to show about the structure of archaeomodernity that I got from Dugan's second Heidegger book. Um, but it's a great topic, and you should definitely search for it and uh, know that I have written about it um, elsewhere. Okay, metamodernity, I don't really know. I know there's this metamodern tribe or metamodern movement. I don't know anything about metamodernity, and whatever I've seen about it has never really attracted me, to tell you the truth, but that's still superficial. The fact that I, I was never initially attracted to Derrida either, but then when I took a closer look, I, um, I came to appreciate it. So there may be something in meta-modernism, but I'm just too unfamiliar with it to comment. So those of you who are advocates or acolytes, you should say something about what you find appealing uh, and attractive about the meta-modern movement. Uh, so here it is possible, if not fundamental, to capture political power in the neoliberal order with money. Yeah, that may be. So even take an issue like money. You know, I've been having conversations with people lately from the Bitcoin community, not about Bitcoin is going to save the world or, you know, Bitcoin is going to make you super wealthy. But what's the relationship between Bitcoin, sovereignty and violence? And so how can we begin to take, again, apparently abstract categories of law, legitimacy, sovereignty, contract and so on and use them to think about this phenomenon? Is there something there or not? So that's just another example. And by the way, you don't have to be talking about Bitcoin or any of those kinds of, you know, encryption technologies or whatever the case is, you can just 
do like Strauss does, for example, in Natural Right and History when he writes about Locke, he brings to light the premises on which Locke liberates as a virtue the passion for acquisition, which previously had been regarded as a vice. Okay, let's go here. Uh, oh yeah, it's Can Opener Podcast, Thinking About Bitcoin. Perfect example. Sorry, I didn't even see that earlier, but it shows that there's a common wavelength. Um, world is a manifesta manifestation of spirit unfolding in the phenomenal world. Yeah, so that's an example of a thesis or a position or a thought or a principle that we could call metaphysical. That there's spirit, that spirit unfolds, that it unfolds in time, that we can track the progress of its temporal unfolding, and that we can sort of um, reconstitute that progress conceptually by philosophizing about it, by giving it the form of conceptual rational articulation, like Hegel does. But, you know, there are other ideas about metaphysics too, and they have different political implications. So that's such a sweet research project. For me, it has been. I want to encourage other people who find again, who resonate with anything you've heard on this channel to sort of pursue it. Uh, yeah, this book by political plate, this book by Dugan political Platonism that I translated does relate to this topic of the relationship between politics and philosophy, which is largely why I translated it as a contribution to that question. Um, because he does lecture on the intimate relationship between philosophy and politics in the first chapter. And you see that he takes, for example, um, notions about the one and the many that he finds in Plato and uses them to think about the various types of democracy and the nature of uh, political life. So once again, why should thinking about the mathematical, as it were, or quantitative categories of one and many, or the categories and metaphysical notions of difference and otherness and identity and equality, and you see they're really on the border of, because equality, there's political equality, but equality is also a notion or a category of trans political thought. So that's the beautiful place, that's a beautiful delineated area where the political concepts and the philosophical notions are intertwined and meshed, uh, co-generative and all of that. So yeah, that's precisely why I, tr I translated those um, essays and presentations and speeches of Dugan's in the book of Political Platonism as a contribution to this question generally and of course as a contribution to the understanding of Dugan uh, and of the reception of Plato and Heidegger particularly. Uh, when I was younger, I used to think politics, philosophy, religion were all completely separate. Now I see how they fit on top of each other. Yeah, so you have, you know, you can go Carl Schmitt, political theology, for example. That's one entry into the debate. A political ontology, political metaphysics, as I said. That's, I don't know, do they fit right on top of each other? But for sure, they affect one another in these profound and um, maybe troubling, exciting, interesting ways. So history is just past, gone, well, again. Yes and no, it depends on, I mean, that's one position. Or is history preserved, like it is to a certain extent in Hegel, in our memory, in our practices, in our institutions, because each new phase of the development of society and each new phase in the development of individuality carries forward with it the developments of the previous stages. In that case, history isn't just past. Or like Husserl writes in The Phenomenology of Time Consciousness, which Dugan references in The Fourth Political Theory, when you're listening to a piece of music, the notes fade away. But the notes that fade away, they're still there. They're preserved. They're still present. They together constitute the melody, as does the anticipation of the notes yet to come. So the time is never just totally as sliced off of the past and the present. It has, I mean, maybe that's one way that time can present itself, but it also can present itself in this continuity where the pastness of the melody is still preserved in a coherence with the present notes that are sounding and fading away in anticipation of those yet to come in the composition. Uh, okay, so that's, that's where we were in the chat. Uh, am I riding the tiger? Are you riding the tiger? Uh, do I accept invites to lunch, dinner to a good local spot for someone that is in Montreal? I'm open to meeting people locally, for sure. Uh, would I revisit Dugan's debate with Carvalho? I wonder if that debate impacted Dugan's philosophy in some way. Yeah, so I, I've never been... Uh, I don't consider myself somebody who knows Olavo de Carvalho's thought particularly well. I did cover the, that debate. Uh, everybody should review, I think, the debate and see who they think anticipated current events more accurately. 
if that's one way of judging it and estimating it. I did hear that the document I had referred to in my video was taken offline or is now, I don't know, harder to find or something like that. So I'm not sure, but I tried to cover as much of it as I could in the video. I don't know whether it impacted Dugan's philosophy. I think that he was pretty hostile. I think they were pretty hostile towards each other. I don't think that they were able to find a common ground for the discussion. I think we learned more about their differences than about any sort of possible dialogue between them by reading their debate. But, uh, but again, I just don't know Lava well enough to want to say more than what I said in those videos. Um, why is it Dugan explores the prospect of a new beginning of philosophy but seems to discredit attempts to restore classical philosophy? You know, that is a good question that I would want to discuss in some detail. I don't think I have all the time to do it now, so let me just say it super briefly. Dugan is not averse to returning to consider the resources of classical philosophy. In fact, one of the benefits for Dugan of the crisis of modernity is that antiquity is back on the table. So you can go back to Plato, which he argues about in his Don't Machia book, which I have a course on, and as you see in political Platonism as well. So there is the possibility of a return to ancient thought, not only Plato, but also the Neoplatonists and also others. However, it's true that Dugan's return to Plato is very different from Strauss's return to Plato. And I think that is a difference that must be uh, recognized, studied, and thought through because a lot hinges on the difference. The, in some way, the texts that they return to, the spirit in which they return to Plato, what they expect to get from returning to Plato is uh, very different. So maybe let me leave it at that for now and possibly dedicate a video to it another time. Um, one of the things is that Heidegger is the key thinker for Dugan. On his own account, he said Heidegger is the deepest foundation of the fourth political theory and so on. And when Heidegger reads Plato, he reads Plato in order to overcome him. I have a long, I mean, I have a, I've, I've written about that before. I, my Plato course includes a bonus mini course on Heidegger's interpretation of the allegory of the cave where I explain this in detail. But Heidegger returns to Plato in order to see more than Plato saw, in order to see what Plato did not see, in order to overcome Plato, and thereby to inaugurate another beginning. Plato stands in the way of another beginning of philosophy. Because for Heidegger, Plato's notion of the ideas, they were already a step away from the origin and the source of philosophical thought, transformation, and inspiration. They start to block the path. And so he wants to overcome Plato. But Strauss does not return to Plato in order to overcome him. Strauss returns to Plato in order to recover what we have lost since Plato. And what we've lost because of an accumulated history of philosophy that has become dogmatic, what we've lost because of a progressivist orthodoxy that has taught us you can only learn about the ancients, you can't learn from them, what we've lost because we've lost the art of reading and we've failed to understand Plato's art of writing. So they both see, it's amazing because both Strauss and Dugan credit Heidegger for making possible a return to Plato in some very important sense. And yet the return to Plato is completely different and that, therefore we have a puzzle. Two intelligent people both recognizing the extreme significance of Heidegger and Plato, but configuring that in totally different ways. That idea that you can have this shared initial impulse, but leading to radically different outcomes is why I wrote beginning with Heidegger, because I saw that Strauss, Leo Strauss, Rorty, Richard Rorty, Derrida, and Dugan, they, for, Heidegger was central for all of them, but they all went in completely different directions in understanding and interpreting him and applying him to political thought. And that leaves us with the puzzle, why? What happened? Like, if, how could they all be reading Heidegger and all be deriving such different uh, conclusions or notions from him? So there's my little pitch. If you're looking for more on this topic, you may want to consider my books. This is, if you go to duganbook.com, you'll see both of these books available and a bunch of other stuff. I have a school, millermanschool.com. I have a new 30-day intro to philosophy. The link is on the screen and in the description. Politics and metaphysics or political ontology, a very beautiful topic, I think, to, uh, to discuss and to study. So thanks for your time. I'm going to run now. Those of you who have been around, you know, I started jujitsu. I have a class coming up. I want to make sure I'm there. Thanks for watching, like, subscribe, share, etc. And feel free to comment on the questions that most interest you. And if you are also in this realm of political ontology, 
Uh, anything that you want to say about that, keep the conversation going in the chat, in the comments. And uh, until next video, take care. See you later. Be well. Goodbye.